Well, we're here on uh, Isla and we're on the beach at uh, Port Charlotte. I just wonder, is this the water that makes the difference to the whiskey here in Isla? You can smell the peat in the air, you can smell a smoky in the air. A reek that's coming from this island is just a sheer whiskey flat. I wonder, is this the water that makes the difference? Isla is one of the most beautiful islands in Scotland. There's no doubt that it has the largest choice of whiskey anywhere in the world. From distilleries like Laphroaig, Beaumont, Ardbeg, Bruchladi, Bukahaban, Lagavulin, Kola Isla, and Kilcoman, the choice is endless. Isla famous for its peaty taste and that special sea breeze and water that surrounds the island. Could you ask for a better location? Roig, one of the largest visitor centres on the island, where you can post your own flag from the country you're from on the pitted fields looking over the mountains. Of course, the exuberant Jim McEwen and the stories behind Brook Laddie. This island has it all. Myself and Swedish connoisseur Connie Forsgren will travel, sample, and interview some of Scotland's leading single malt distillers. What we're in search of is the fun stories from the people behind these fabulous drums. Stories that you won't have heard on the back of a bottle, or on some leaflet, or book. These are stories from the actual people from the whiskey industry. The people that make the spirit that we all enjoy all over the world. This is Isla Spirit. I phone up my, my, my accountant and he says to me, what do you need to do is he says, you buy the cask and you take out a 21 year endowment policy for your child. He says, and when your whiskey's matured and your child is, is matured to 21, you've got all enough money to take it out of the house. Now, I was in my office there. We've done it and we done this, we put it in and, and we suggested to him, why don't you write a personal message and we'll staple it to the cask. So he wrote this, and he was in there for about an hour and he wrote this message. And we didn't have these uh, laminous laminar things there. We put it in a in a in a, a poly bag, you know, and sealed it up and stapled it onto the cast. And uh, must have been about two years ago, my phone went in the office and the voice went, uh, can I speak to Molly Coffin? I said, Yeah, speaking. Ah, uh, you don't remember me, he says, uh, Tony, Tony Hitchcock. Uh, we just went totally out. Then I suddenly went, you laid down a cask. He says, you've done visions of you. And he went, that's right. I said, you're not fool enough to tell me your, your baby's 21, your son's 21 year old, are you? And he went, he is. I says, but you want to take it out? He says, no. He says, what I want you to do, he says, <laughs> I want you to go up there and take that message off it. He says, and send it to me. He says, I can't remember a word I wrote. He says, it's just probably as soppy as hell. He says, I'm <laughs> He says, I want to read it before I gave it. And I, I put it up there and pulled it off the cask. And I, I didn't know what I mean, obviously I did. It was all sealed. And I sent it away. And then about six weeks later, he, he emailed back saying, uh, oh, can I get the cask? And I told him how to get it. He contacted the company, paid the duty and all that on it. But now he's, he's, he's got his own business and all that kind of thing. So I'm with Alan from Brookladdy. Uh, Alan, can you please let me know about how you got became involved in Brookladdy and what the story went from there? Okay, uh, so um, it was a, a lifelong ambition to become a distiller. Um, I, it was, it's in my family genes. Um, I'm the third generation of my family to be distilling on Isla. And uh, I grew up in the, uh, the grounds of Lefroy. My father worked there. It's something that I quite as, as growing up, it was something I, 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 at a young age I discovered that you know, that's what I wanted to do was follow, follow on in the family footsteps of, of making whiskey on Isla. So at, um, when I, at the early stage of being able to leave school, at the age of 16, um, I um, uh, had the, the ambition to, to go and work in the, the, the whiskey distilleries. I approached some of the distilleries in Isla um, Again, it was, I, 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 it, was, it was difficult because my age, I had no experience, so I was, um, I, I was told that, you know, this lady was too young, so I should come back when I'm a bit more mature. 
So it was a, it was a bit disheartening, but um, I was fortunate enough when Brickladdy reopened in 2001 um, that I knew Jim McEwen quite well. So I came, spoke to Jim, uh, uh, explained my dream and what I wanted to do. He was aware of my family and you know he's worked with some of my family and I knew Jim quite well because he, he taught us at football on a Saturday morning. He was a football <laughs> coach. So, so uh, Jim, uh, yeah, was uh, very understanding and he wanted to um, encourage youngsters to, to come into the industry because it was important to get that balance of getting the, the young people, the next generation coming through to, to take on the experience from the older generation. So yeah, it was um, uh, that was how I got introduced into the whiskey industry. I was I was very happy, I was at the age of uh, just, I was 19, just turning 20 when I started in the industry. Um, so Jim took me under his wing um, uh, and you know I had to start off in the in the production warehousing, basically start off learning how uh, the, the, the process works and understanding the, the, the craft of making whiskey. So I, I spent you know, basically uh, eight, nine years doing that mm. before then going on to taking on the day to day running of this. And now you're, 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 you're the boss, really. Yeah, so the, I've now the distillery manager, so I have the, the, the responsibility of the day to day running, um, ensuring everything's the production is going to smoothly, the quality of what we make, the quality of the, the ingredients we use, malted barley um, and such, the barrels we buy, make sure everything's fit for purpose. Yeah. So, so when it reopened in 2001, the process between coming in here, bird poo everywhere, all, all of it, and, and getting that first drop of whiskey, how, how did that materialise? And what was the process? How yeah. Long well, I think since Jim, when Jim agreed to to um, well, when, when, uh, that, that first discussion with Jim when I came to see him about uh, my dream about working in the whisky industry, and him actually agreeing to employ me, uh, took about thirty seconds, you know. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think that the fact that um, uh, almost straight after uh, he, he he says, you know, basically, when can you start? He did, took us a walk around the distillery and uh, we walked around the, the buildings and because it had been shut for six years and you know prior to it being shut there had been no investment made in the, in the equipment and the distillery was, was in a poor condition. So I quickly started to realise uh, maybe we made a mistake here. I, I was starting to think uh, what have I done because um, it, you know everything was rusted and mashed under the sea solid you know it was just um, there was bird poo everywhere they say and it was just the windows there was no the roofs were leaking there was water coming in. It was really bad. This was in January, so the place was cold and damp. I, I really then thought, you know, you know, this is going to be an impossible task. And you know, for the, um, we basically had to revive the distillery, get it back to life. So there was a team of eight of us. There was only eight people uh, in the team, uh, and we were led by Jim. Uh, and I think it was Jim's uh, passion and enthusiasm that drove us to actually get the distillery back on its feet. Because um, I say it was, it was going to be a difficult, it was a difficult challenge. We, we felt that you know, some days we were coming in and we were thinking, well, you know, will this ever work again? But um, Jim's dream and, and enthusiasm made it happen. Um, so the, the the day May 29th, 2001 was the first day that we we actually managed to make spirit again in Brook Valley. Uh, so it, it, production ceased in 1994, and. In May 2001, uh, we managed to, to turn the stores back on at Rafari. And it was quite a, it was a very emotional moment, I was going to say quite, but it was a very emotional moment because we'd taken some of the staff that had previously worked here, um, uh, they came back to work with us because they were the experienced, they knew how the distillery operated, they came back to, to run the distillery. And um, for them, you know, they had been made redundant and, you know, they never thought we'd see the distillery running again. Um, so the, the emotion was up running high there, but I think it was more just the amount of work and determination went into making this and getting it back on its feet again. I think it was a, a sense of relievement and a sense of happiness and a sense of pure emotion basically that we were just so happy that the, the, the fact that this lady had actually produced some alcohol because you know <laughs> for six months uh, prior to that we were basically just you know painting and cleaning and you know. And the first drop did you have was all gravity. Yeah so it was quite uh, it was a tense moment because um, Jim was there and obviously he had never seen Burkhardy work running and you know that was his you know it was a big moment because he was curious to see what the spirit was going to be like the profile the, the, the character and 
uh, Jim was uh, quite, uh, he was uh, walking the floor quite impatiently, waiting on the still boiling and you know, he was, um, and then when the still started running, obviously we, we run four shots for um, a period of time and now when you're distilling the way that we, uh, you know, craft distilling, you're basically it's using, you're using your sense of smell and your taste to, to determine how uh, it works. So when the still started running, Jim was um, nosing and tasting and then passing it around, but he was starting to, his, uh, his patience was starting to, to show and he was starting to get concerned because the, he felt that the, the spirit just wasn't coming, it wasn't coming clearly enough and there was a lot of uh, heavy, heavy uh, methanol, a lot of strong alcohols coming through and, and he was starting to worry and he, it sensed and I think everybody was just basically a silence in this still house that you know, uh, nobody was talking. So we're thinking, you know, no, is this, you know, we've done all this work and it's not going to work, you know, and, you know, what's, what's going to happen? But um, just giving it a bit more time and running the still. So after about 30, 35 minutes running on four shots, so we still run to 35 minutes on four shots. Um, so we have a long four shots, but we make sure that, you know, that just all these heavy alcohols are, de are distilled out. And, after 35 minutes running on four shots, then just finally, you know, Jim had taken and drawn a sample and his look of surprise, you know, just in the difference of a few minutes, you know, he'd taken a sample a few minutes before that and he drew a sample and then his eyes lit up and just that delight of the hand. Then he smiled and then there was this, you know, and then he passed the glass round and then everybody took a, a sample and then there was magic in the air. There was magic in there, but there was also a lot of emotion. There was some of the the, the, the workers that had been there. Were, you know, there was a lot of emotion. There was tears. There was about tears of happiness that they actually the distillery was back running, and that was the spirit that they once remembered. You know, uh, prior to it being shut down. So it was, yeah, it was a very uh, proud moment for us all. That's and uh, yeah, I mean, you know, from strength to strength, from there, you know, continue to to make. Fantastic spirit, and you know we've not changed the, the style of Bertrandi ever since. So, as we're leaving rainy Isla, nowhere's perfect. <laughs>